this beautiful book that I just finished reading. It's called Behind the Scenes, 30 Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House. And it's written by Elizabeth Keckley. Now, Elizabeth Keckley was a slave um, who bought her freedom and became a seamstress and became Mrs. Abraham Lincoln's best friend. And everybody should have a best friend like Elizabeth. My marshal's behind me here, and he said he'll only butt in if he hears me get some facts wrong, <laughs> which I might do. Um, but just like Frederick Douglass, uh, Elizabeth was raised in the same house as her mother uh, as a slave. And her first job at the age of four was to take care of her master's infant, a little girl. And... Everything, you know, Elizabeth was very excited about that because she called the little girl her pet and just loved to take care of her and play with her until one day the uh, little baby fell off the bed. And remember, Elizabeth was only four and she didn't really know what to do. So she grabbed the fireplace shovel and tried to pick her up and put her back in bed. <clears throat> well, of course, the mistress walks in and sees this. And Elizabeth gets a severe beating. She talks about the first time that she saw someone sold on the auction block was the maid who worked at the same house, her son. Uh, she was told that he needed to go with them to sell a pig. And they wanted her to clean him up and dress him up very nicely, which she did. And he left the next morning to go sell the pig and never came back. Well, the maid, of course, was just grief stricken. Um, but she got beat for that because according to Elizabeth, slave owners in those days did not like sad slaves. You were supposed to walk around acting like you were happy all the time uh, because the way you treated your, your slaves uh, was... A source of stigma. If you mistreated them, you would get a bad reputation. But if you treated them well, you would be thought of in higher esteem, even though you were still a slave owner, which is a lot of what Frederick Douglass said as well. So Elizabeth, just like Frederick Douglass, was taken back and forth and back and forth, depending on, on who needed her, which family member needed her the most. Um, they would switch them around. She talks about how her father was sent back to live with her and her mother, and they were just so excited. She'd never met her father, and um, he loved her dearly and only got to spend several days with them before he found out he was being sent somewhere else, and it just broke their hearts. And uh, she said she never got to see her father again. Uh, the last memory she has of him was him hanging on to her mother, weeping his eyes out and saying, I hope to see you in heaven. Elizabeth was living with a member of the family who was a minister, a Presbyterian minister and his wife. And she was sent to live with them because the wife didn't know how to do anything. And so Elizabeth talks about how she had to do absolutely everything. And the wife was very jealous of her abilities and was harsh with her. But the minister was always kind to her. She talks talks about him always being very kind in, in the way that he spoke and always praised her for the work that she did. There was a school teacher, though, who um, had a side job other than teaching school, and that was to break slaves' pride. So the wife of this minister 
hired him to break Elizabeth's pride. In other words, I'm very jealous of you and all you can do. And I think you're very prideful. Not me, you. So I'm going to hire someone to break your spirit. So the schoolmaster would come to the home. And the first time he told Elizabeth that she needed to join him in the den because he was going to beat her. And she said, beat me for what? I've not done anything. <laughs> and he said, you're too prideful and I'm going to have to beat it out of you. She talks about how this happened once a week for at least a month. He would come to the house and she would fight him back. But by the time it was over with, she would be bruised, broken, bloody, um, near death and go back to work for her owners who would act like nothing happened. Uh, but yet, the next week, the schoolmaster would come again. Now, this happened for about a month. The last time that it happened, she fought him back again, and she told him, she said, I'm ready to die. Just kill me. I, I don't care. <laughs> Just kill me and get it over with. And he started to beat her and beat her, and something happened. I, she talks about how blood was dripping from her head. And all of a sudden he had a change of heart and he stood there and he started crying. And he told her, he said, I'm so ashamed of myself. I am so sorry for what I've put you through. And I will never lay a hand on anyone else as long as I live. And she said that he never did. Um, however... Since he would no longer beat her, uh, the minister's wife told her husband he would need to do it because she was very proud. Somebody needed to beat this out of her. So Elizabeth talks about how one time uh, he told her, I'm going to have to start taking this job over. And he picked up a chair and started beating her with it. And she implored him to stop and said, I've never done you any harm. I've worked hard for you the whole time I've been here. She was crying. Her, she was bleeding. And she said, he put down the chair and said, I'll, uh, I'll never do this again. I'm so sorry. I'm so embarrassed. But there was more to it than that. The word got out that the minister was beating his slave. And like I said before, that got a bad reputation. Uh, because uh, here the minister is in church every Sunday talking about loving each other and kindness. And there was much prejudice back then. This was in the South. This is in Virginia. But still, the way you treated your slaves was a reflection on you. So it immediately stopped. Um, luckily, uh, around the age of 19 or so, Elizabeth found a talent that she had. Eventually, Elizabeth was sent back, thank goodness, <laughs> to her original owner's daughter, who was an adult by this time. She had married a very nice man, according to Elizabeth, and his name was Mr. Burwell. Um, she talks about she was very fond of Mr. Burwell, and she was very fond of the daughter of her original slave owner, and they were very good to her. The problem is they were very poor and they were starving. Um, they had their own family to take of. They had these uh, take care of. They had slaves to take care of and they couldn't do it. They were starving. So they began to talk about kicking her mother out, letting her go. Well, she couldn't stand that because they, by this time her mother was elderly. She had raised every member of that family from infancy. And where was she going to go? How was she going to take care of herself? And so Elizabeth went to Mr. Burwell and, and told him, I'll do anything. I'll do my mom's work. I'll do my work. Uh, on top of that, I'll do whatever I can to bring in money if you just promise me you will not get rid of her. And she had learned how to sew, and she'd become fairly good at it, but she, she was doing slave work. So she was cleaning, she was cooking, she was working out in the fields when they needed her. Um, she hadn't got to really hone her skills. 
So when she had free time, after Mr. Burwell agreed, she would go in and take in sewing from other women. And she said that she be, she began uh, getting quite the clientele and they thought she did really good work. And so she was paid well. Well, okay. So she said by that time, she was supporting 17 people <laughs> because her master wasn't making any money. She was making money and he would let her go more often because she was bringing in all this money and supporting everyone at that time, including her mother. Uh, Elizabeth just hits on this shortly that uh, there was a member of the community who had his eyes on her. Um, and she became pregnant. She had a little boy. And so she was taking care of him and herself and everyone else in the house. She met a slave named Mr. Keckley. And she said Mr. Keckley had told her that he was a free slave. And so if she was to marry him, who was a free slave, she could be free as well. If her master would would let her go, which he did agree he would let her go. So she married Mr. Keckley. She was not really fond of him, not in love with him, but uh, thought he would be, you know, a, play, a good, safe place to take care of her son, take care of herself, and get her out of slavery. Well, she soon finds out Mr. Mr. Keckley is not a free slave. He is a slave, and he's a lazy slave. And so he wouldn't work beyond what he was told to do. He wouldn't go out. Now, can you imagine you work all day long as a slave like Elizabeth did and many other people as well? Let's remember Frederick Douglass used to work all day long as a slave and then go out and work on boats um, to make extra money. And they were allowed to keep just a little bit. So for every $10 you make, you give your, your slave master nine, you get to keep one. And um, basically, that's what Elizabeth was doing. But Mr. Keckley would not go out and get extra work. So she was a very strong woman, very strong woman. And so she told her master, I, I need to get a divorce. I am not going to support him, too. 18 people <laughs> now, 19, counting her little son. Elizabeth told Mr. Keckley of her plan that she had had enough. And um, she was still kind in the way she talked about him. Basically, she said, bless his soul. <laughs> bless his soul. He just couldn't help the way he was. But he was making, making her sick. On top of all the work that she had to do herself um, and take care of him as well and the baby and everybody else, she couldn't do it anymore. Uh, her, she went to uh, her master. And uh, she said, I need to go up north. I need to go up north and make some more money so I can come back and I can pay to get this marriage uh, dissolved. And while she was at it, she said, I would like to pay for my freedom and my son's freedom. Well, let's remember, everybody was pretty well relying on Elizabeth uh, to earn the money, and without her, they would be starving. So her owner said, well, I'll tell you what, uh, you can buy your freedom and your sons for $1,200. Now, $1,200 back then was like 20, 25000 now. Um, and this is a slave whose only income is keeping the meager amount that you allow her to keep. Um, so she tried to squirrel away money, uh, but it just it wasn't coming fast enough. And she was thinking, I'll die by the time this happens. So she presents to her her master um, and she says, please let me go uh, up north to St. Louis, where there are a lot of rich people, and see if I can make some money there. And I promise you, uh, I'll come back. And he said, no, you won't. No, you won't. You're going to go to St. Louis, and you're never going to come back. 
And she said, I pr- it's my word. I promise you I will come back. And when I come back, I'll have the money and I, I'll get my son. And she kept her word. She went to St. Louis and it was hard times for a while. Uh, she would go door to door and she would introduce herself. She would show some of the work that she had done. She would try to get clients. She made a client named Miss Ringgold in St. Louis, who was very kind, very sweet woman. Um, and she said, Elizabeth, I'll start bringing you uh, clients. You do beautiful work. I'll do, you know, the best I, I can. Well, these women became very fond of Elizabeth. And she did beautiful work, but they were really fond of her. And so they told her, we will loan you the money. We will loan you the money. And she felt terrible about that. And and she told them, I will pay all of you back. I will pay all of you back, you know. And they're like, whenever. There's no, you don't have to do it soon, whenever you get established, but we will pay for your freedom. And they did. They raised money for her and she went back to her master and she bought her freedom for her and her son. Um, But she had big ambitions and she wanted to be a seamstress and she wanted to own her own business during a time when uh, slavery you know, having your own business, that was about a joke. But not only that, being a woman and having your own business made it even harder. But she was a visionary and she wanted to work for the women in Washington. She felt her work was good enough um, that she could really make a living in Washington. So she and her son left for Washington. Now, as if Elizabeth's life on its own wasn't interesting enough, This is where it really gets interesting. Um, And let me just add a side note here. I've I've talked to you guys before about primary sources, that if you want to really find out about history, to try to find a primary source. Well, I had just heard about this book and uh, checked my local library and was so excited to find out they had a copy. But when I went to get it, I was very disappointed to see that this book has only been checked out four times since 1998. It made me so sad because this is a great, great reference of American history from a slave's point of view. But not only that, we're going to learn so much about Mary Todd Lincoln. So let's get on to the second part before I get all weepy. (laughs) When Elizabeth went to Washington, she went door to door and took her goods with her and uh, introduced herself and told people where she was living and showed them her patterns and word quickly spread. Uh, She had a few customers that would refer other women to her But her big break came when one of her customers referred her to Mrs. Jefferson Davis. She was uh, staying in Washington at the time. Uh, Let's remember Jefferson Davis was the uh, became the president of the Southern States during the Civil War. But uh, here they were up in Washington at the time. And uh, Mrs. Davis and Elizabeth became friends. (laughs) Now, when you hear about Jefferson Davis, uh, you hear he must have been a racist, right? Because he was the president of the South. And uh, so you would assume that his wife would be a mean racist, Uh, because she was the wife of the president of the South. Um, But not according to Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth says that uh, Mrs. Davis, uh, and she would talk about things that were going on within the country, and Mrs. Davis really felt like a war was going to happen. And she begged Elizabeth 
to come south with them and live with them, not as a slave, uh, but to continue to making dresses for the women of the south because she told Elizabeth, I'm afraid if you stay here in the north, um, people will, even though, the, even though they're fighting for the freedom of slavery, um, they will begin to resent people of color as they start to lose their own family members. Elizabeth thought about it seriously. She seriously thought about going south with the Davis family, um, but decided not to. Uh, but Mrs. Mrs. Davis uh, kept her very busy uh, making dresses. And so you can imagine these women in Washington, right? And I imagine it's much the same now. You have one show up to a party <laughs> looking absolutely stunning. And everyone wants to know where did she get that dress? <laughs> where did she get that hat? Kind of thing. So that's what happened. Mrs. Davis went to a Christmas party and everyone was talking about her beautiful, beautiful dress. And where did she get it? Well, it caught the attention of, a, of another soldier and his name was Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee walks over to her during the party and puts $100 in her hand. And says, Mrs. Keckley, I would appreciate it if you would make my wife a dress of your choosing for Christmas. She talks about General Lee. And he was such a gentleman, so kind. And his wife was very kind, very, very sweet. And she worked night and day and night and day until Christmas to get that dress done. And at one point, Mr. Lee stopped by where she lived to see how the dress was coming. And she said, I am working on it night and day. And Mr. Lee said, I don't want you to do that. I, I, you know, I have every faith in you. It will be done by Christmas. I don't want you to become ill trying to to satisfy me. And uh, she said, I promise you, it will be ready by Christmas. And it was. Well, so guess what happens? A new family is in Washington now from Kentucky. Everyone's talking about them, the new president and the new president's wife. They're nothing but hicks from the hills of Kentucky. They're poor. They're not like us. Now, who does that sound like? <laughs> Talk about if you study history. Um, it's very interesting when you have outsiders come in, how the inner swamp starts to act. So immediately, Mary Todd Lincoln was on the outs. They were nothing but Hicks from Kentucky, and so was her husband. And how he got the presidency, God only knows. Well, you know how women like to talk. <laughs> and the dress that Mrs. Davis had and the dress that General Lee's wife got for Christmas became the talk of Washington. And so another customer came to Elizabeth's shop and said, I must have a dress. For an event I'm going to and I need it within so many days and Elizabeth said I'm so sorry I am so swamped now um, which was a great thing because word had gotten out she was busier and busier um, but this customer said no 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 you will get my dress done in several days and let me tell you why if you get it done to my satisfaction in a couple days I will introduce you to the president's wife. What? <laughs> this former slave might have the opportunity of making a dress for the president's wife. Could you imagine how business 
would skyrocket if that were to happen. Not that it wasn't anyway. Elizabeth was getting wealthy. She was getting wealthy. But she agreed because she, that was her goal. I am going to make a dress for the president's wife. What an honor. She finished that client's dress and good to her word, that client introduced her to Mrs. Lincoln. Mrs. Lincoln told Elizabeth, she said, I love your work. I love your work, but I want you to know we're poor. <laughs> Those were her exact words, according to Elizabeth. We're poor. We're from Kentucky and we have no money. So whatever you make for me has got to be just rock bottom price right now because I don't have the money to pay for it. And um, Mrs. Keckley said, money is no object right now. We don't need to worry about it right now. I just want to get my name out there. And I'm more than happy to make you some, a few dresses uh, until you're established. And so that's how they became friends. Well, Elizabeth talks about how Mrs. Uh, Lincoln, she would go there for fittings. She would go to the White House for fittings. And Mr. Lincoln would come in and, and they would talk about the day's events and he would sit on the couch and he would read the paper and they would chit chat back and forth. Um, she talked about the children. Um, Willie was Mrs. Lincoln's favorite, according to Elizabeth. She said uh, he was uh, very studious, very quiet, very serious boy and spent most of his time with Mrs. Lincoln. And Tad was real mischievous and uh, always getting into things and always telling funny jokes and, and pulling pranks. And that he was the president's favorite son, according to Elizabeth. Um, they also had a son named Edward, who had passed away when he was about four from illness. And so Elizabeth learned a lot about the family. She was with them a lot as she was making dresses for Mrs. Lincoln. Um, she eventually, they would be getting ready to go downstairs to a party and she would dress Mrs. Lincoln and she would do her hair and she would do the president's hair. Uh, he started asking her, would you mind trying to do something with mine? <laughs> um, and she became very close to the family. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln confided in her. Uh, she had no other friends. The, these other women in Washington were, were very standoffish with her and uh, thought she wasn't elegant enough, sophisticated enough, smart enough to uh, run in their circles. So Elizabeth was uh, really all that Mary Todd Lincoln had. Must be doing okay because Marshall hasn't butted in yet. <laughs> this is a sad part of the story. I'm sure you've heard it many times. Uh, when Willie Lincoln was 11, he became very sick. There was a reception being held at the White House downstairs. The living quarters were upstairs. And the family was very, very worried. He was having trouble breathing. Um, so they sent for, uh, Mrs. Lincoln sent for Elizabeth um, because that, that was her best friend. And so Elizabeth said she came and, and uh, tried to comfort Willie um, while they had to go to this reception. They, neither one of them wanted to go. But the doctor came and said, he's in no grave danger. He's, he's sick, but he'll be feeling better. So go, go ahead and go. Um, so they did. But all night long, they would come upstairs uh, quite often and check to see how their son was doing. And according to Elizabeth, he was getting worse as time went on. Uh, she said it was a surreal event because... Here is this young boy upstairs, deathly ill, 
but you could hear gaiety downstairs in the Marine Band playing. And um, you, could, you can just imagine that, can't you? Um, she said the Lincolns, you know, continued to come upstairs and, and Mrs. Lincoln was just beside herself, just beside herself with, with anxiety. Um, but the doctor kept assuring that he'll be fine. This is nothing that he won't, he'll be fine in the morning. Can just go down to your party. But he continued to get worse and the next day even worse and he lingered for several days, and he eventually passed away. Elizabeth said that it was the most heartbreaking thing she had ever seen. Even though her own son had died in the war, fighting for the North a month or so earlier. And she talks about how Mrs. Lincoln wrote her a letter, a very, very sweet letter, uh, of sympathy when she had heard about her son. Um, Elizabeth talks about Mary Todd Lincoln became despondent and wouldn't come out of her room for weeks, weeks, and would just in a fetal position and would rock back and forth and wail and cry and just beside herself. Now, this is her second son that she has lost. Eddie, the youngest, died at the age of four. So this is very, very hard. And, um, but a very touching part of the story is Elizabeth's recollection of Abraham Lincoln at that time. She worshipped the man. <laughs> she said he was smart. He was funny. He would tell jokes. But he would be serious and very, very kind. Um, she said that, uh, after Willie had passed away, she assisted in washing and dressing him. And then he was laid out on the bed and Mr. Lincoln came in. She said, I never saw a man so bowed down in grief. He came to the bed. He lifted the cover from the face of his child and gazed at it long and earnestly murmuring, my poor boy, he was too good for this earth. God has called him home. I know he's in a much better place in heaven, but we loved him so. It's so hard. It's so hard to have him die. Uh, she said that he was choking uh, because he was crying so hard. He buried his head in his hands. And she said he was just convulsing with emotion. I stood at the foot of the bed, my eyes full of tears, looking at the man in wonder. Mrs. Lincoln did not go to Willie's uh, visitation or funeral. She was too grieved. Um, but Elizabeth talks about all the statesmen that were there and that attended and how everyone was just heartbroken. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln continued to grieve for months and months and months. And Elizabeth talks about an instance when Mr. Lincoln came into the room and asked her to get up and he walked her to the window. They looked out the window and he said, Mother, do you see that building over there? And she said, yes. And he said, if you don't get better soon, I will have no choice but to put you there. And it was an asylum. And I think that kind of scared her enough that uh, she was determined to at least put on a good face. And Elizabeth talks about how Mrs. Lincoln began getting up again and trying to participate in life. But it was, it was very hard for her. She even talks about Mr. Lincoln himself seemed like he just aged overnight. The country was at war. He's lost a son. Um, people are dying. You have the weight of all of that on you. Elizabeth, there's so many beautiful, beautiful memories in this book, but she talks about one that is very poignant to me. Uh, she said, Mr. Lincoln came into the, the bedroom 
where she and uh, Mrs. Lincoln were visiting, and he just looked awful, just wore out, barely able to walk, and just exhausted. The At that time, the South was winning, and um, he was afraid that there would be no union because the South was winning. And um, so he went and sat down on the couch and picked up a Bible. And she said he looked absolutely exhausted and defeated. But he sat there reading the Bible. And that when he got up, he looked so different. It was like something had come, come over him. And he stood straight up. And he walked out of the room with an assurance in, in his step. And so she said she pretended uh, that she needed something on the other side of the room where he had been sitting because he had left the Bible open. And she wanted to see what it said. And it was the book of Job. And she uh, tells the story. Uh, she said, I almost imagined that I could hear the Lord speaking to him from out of the whirlwind of battle. Gird up thy loins now like a man. I demand of thee and de declare thou unto me. What a sublime picture was this. A ruler of a mighty nation going to the pages of the Bible with a simple Christian earnest for comfort and courage and finding both in the darkest hours of our nation's calamity. Ponder it, O ye scoffers of God's holy word, and then hang your heads for very shame. Elizabeth talks about the Lincoln's oldest son, uh, Robert, as being a very serious, um, solemn type of person. But he wanted to fight in the war. And uh, his father had put him off and put him off. <laughs> and mother, of course, I've already lost enough. I've lost enough, and I'm not going to lose another son. But Robert was, he was determined. He, he wanted to do his part and fight in the war. So Mr. Lincoln eventually talked uh, Mary into letting Robert uh, fight for the North. Uh, I imagine he was given some jobs that kind of kept him out of battle, you know, quite often. But he did serve his country, and that's something to be proud of. Um, so she talks about Robert being a, a cool head, very, very serious. Um, Mrs. Lincoln, about the time that uh, Mr. Lincoln was going to run for a second term, she just became anxious and frantic and nervous all the time, <laughs> all the time. And she would send for Elizabeth, but when uh, Elizabeth would come, she re really wouldn't share what was going on other than saying she was nervous. She was just so nervous about this second um, election you know do you, what do you think do you think he's going to win do you really think he'll win why do you think he'll win you know well finally elizabeth said i don't understand why you why you don't think your husband will win um the people love him they love what he they just love him um well she talks about general grant and she said he's a butcher he's a butcher and people don't like him they don't like that my husband has chosen him to lead us, and uh, but she said, but he's but he's winning. You know the tables are turning now because of Grant. So I really do think that uh, President Lincoln will win, but I don't understand why you're just so anxious. Well, Mrs. Lincoln spilled the beans. Uh, I owe thousands of dollars, and Mrs. Keckley said. For what? How could you, you, you know, you're the president's wife. Uh, you're making money now. How can you owe thousands of dollars? And Mrs. Lincoln begins to tell her, I have to keep up appearances. You know, uh, I mean, I have to have a certain way of life here in the White House, certain furniture, uh, you know, certain um, artwork. I, and she particularly owed a store in New York 
20 some thousand dollars, which was <laughs> uh, huge back then. And to make matters worse, Mr. Lincoln didn't know about it. And so Mrs. Lincoln told Elizabeth, if he doesn't win the second term, I, I don't know what's going to become of this because I still owe this money. He has got to win so I can have an income to pay this money. Elizabeth thought about talking to Mr. Lincoln <laughs> um, because she thought, this is terrible. This is terrible. Like I said, she worshipped him. She loved Mrs. Lincoln, too. But she thought, I can't have this be his demise if this would get out. But she decided against it. It wasn't best to get in between a husband and his wife. And luckily, Mr. Lincoln won his second term. During the president's second term, uh, one evening, Elizabeth had a knocking at her door late at night. And there was a messenger at the door who said, Mrs. Lincoln needs to see you right away. It's an emergency. Uh, she knew it must be serious because Mrs. Lincoln didn't send for her in the evenings. So she told the people she was living with, they did not want her to go out by herself. So they said they would go with her. And she said it immediately when they opened the door, they knew something was terribly wrong. People were running up and down the street. Uh, they were uh, loud. It was eerie, uh, wandering around. And so she grabbed someone and said, what is going on? And, and the gentleman said, uh, Mr. Lincoln has been shot. And she was just in shock and said, is, is he alive? And the gentleman said, barely. So she tried and tried and tried to get to Mrs. Lincoln, but the messenger had told her the wrong apartment number where they had taken Mrs. Lincoln to. So she spent the whole evening trying to find her, and uh, the next morning was able to get in touch with someone who took her to the correct place. Uh, when she got there, Mr. Lincoln had already passed away. They had him laying out in another bedroom. Mrs. Lincoln, of course, was hysterical um, and said, Elizabeth, where were you? I've been trying to get you here. I needed you here. And Elizabeth said, I've been trying all night long to come to you, but they gave me the wrong, uh, they gave me the wrong address, uh, apartment number where you were. And she said, Mrs. Lincoln was just hysterical. And uh, the only thing that would stop her from crying would be when Tad would come in and say, Mother, please stop. If you don't stop, I'm going to start, and we'll all die together. And she just couldn't bear for Tad to be sad, so she would stop until he left the room. She also said that Robert, the oldest boy, that he was very kind to his mother and, and tried to get her to relax. But five weeks, five weeks went that Mrs. Lincoln grieved. Elizabeth talks about going in and seeing Mr. Lincoln and called him her Moses. He was her Moses, and he had passed away, and the grief for her was unmeasurable as well. Um, but five weeks, uh, during that five weeks of mourning for Mrs. Lincoln, Elizabeth reports no one came to see her. No women in Washington uh, uh, the vice president's wife, the vice president, Johnson, nobody came to see her. Uh, it was just her boys. And basically, she was told during that five weeks, time for you to pack up now and get out because uh, your husband's not president anymore. So she began rallying eventually and uh, had to start really thinking practically, how am I going to pay my debts? How are we going to eat? What are we going to do to survive, even though I don't even want to live anymore? And so she kept packing up boxes and packing up boxes. And Robert would say, Mom, why are you taking that stuff? Well, because we may need it later on. Well, why are you taking those dresses? Leave the dresses. We don't need, you're never going to wear those dresses now. 
And she would say, you just never know. I really want, I really want to take those dresses with me. Um, come to find out, uh, they ended up going to Chicago and living uh, very meagerly uh, there. And uh, Mrs. Lincoln uh, was trying to get a pension. The Civil War soldiers, when they were killed, they would get a slight pension for their widow. Um, and she was trying to get a pension from Mr. Lincoln being killed during the Civil War, and she was given nothing at that time. Uh, so they were really hurting. Elizabeth notes that Tad, who had always been spoiled by the president and was waited on hand and foot because he was the president's son, uh, became a man overnight and uh, said, I, I know that someday I'll be in heaven with, with Willie and father. Uh, I know that people were only kind to me because I was the president's son. Uh, but I will do whatever I can for the rest of my life to make them proud. And uh, he began taking care of himself and behaving and trying to be good for his mother. Uh, since he had been spoiled so long, um, he never learned to read. And so Mrs. Lincoln, after they left and they arrived in Chicago, really made that her mission. She was going to get him teach him to read. Um, and so, you you know, if you do some uh, investigating on Ted, you, you'll see that uh, he was a little slow learner, um, and that may have had something to do with his uh, honoriness, um, his acting out in other ways. But, but uh, according to Elizabeth, he really grew to be a good boy. Um, he ended up passing away at the age of 18, um, because of a heart problem. So Mrs. Lincoln saw yet another son pass away. Mrs. Lincoln got a hold of Elizabeth and asked her to come uh, with her to New York. She needed to sell off her things. So when Robert was saying, Mom, what are you doing with all that stuff? We don't need all that stuff. We don't have room for all that stuff. That was Mary Todd Lincoln's plan, was I've got debts to pay. <laughs> I don't want you to know about it. I didn't tell your dad, but I have debts to pay. I need to sell this stuff off. Um, it became very complicated. She went to New York under an assumed name, uh, and Elizabeth went with her, and they made contact with like a, uh, a, a go-between. These two men that would sell Mrs. Lincoln's clothing uh, anonymously. She was going uh, under the name of Clark. Uh, but the men were having, you know, they were promising, we're going to sell this stuff. We're going to make thousands and thousands. Uh, well, that was during the war. So a dress that was worth $500 before the war, and then during the war, it would still be a valuable artifact. After the war, the price fell. So a $500 dress was a $100 dress after the war. And so they were having trouble selling her things. So they finally thought if we could tell people who these articles belonged to, this jewelry, these clothes, she had some slight pieces of furniture. If we could tell them, you know, we'd probably make more money. So they spilled the beans. Well, when the news got a hold of this, uh, they were just unrelentless. You know, they already thought she was a hick from Kentucky and that they weren't smart and, and uh, that they were low class. When they found out that she had debts, oh my goodness, how could she have bought all those things on a president's salary and racked up all that debt and then they began making fun of her clothing. Uh, oh, I would be so embarrassed to put that dress up for sale. It's just, it, the hem is falling out of it. It's got a hole in it. It's not worth what she paid for it. I, I mean, now here was a woman. Okay, so she shouldn't have done it and bought things on credit, but was trying to get out of debt. So I'm selling, I'm trying to sell all my things in good faith. In good faith, 
so that I can pay my debts. Uh, all kinds of schemes, you know, happened because of this, and she, her reputation just kept getting hammered. And so these men were having trouble selling her clothing because, as you know, the nation's opinion of her, nobody, they're like, no, she deserves what she gets. Even though the woman saw her husband's brains blown out right in front of her. And he was the president of the United States trying to keep the country together. They hated her enough that their hate would keep them from helping her. So these two gentlemen decided, well, what we'll do is we'll have an exhibition and people will pay to come see Mrs. Lincoln's clothes. Well, that earned some money, but not enough to pay off her debts. Little by little, some people would buy a dress, some people would buy a piece of jewelry, but it was at rock bottom price. So it was taking forever for her um, to get the money she needed to pay off her debts. Uh, in the meantime, she couldn't buy anything new for herself, and they were barely able to buy food to feed themselves. And she was still trying to get a, a pension uh, for the president. Um, Elizabeth talks about how she went to Frederick Douglass and she went to other wealthy uh, African Americans in the um, New York area and said, hey, we all have to chip in uh, to help the Lincoln family. And they were all more than willing uh, to help. And when she told Mrs. Lincoln this, Mrs. Lincoln said, no, I, I can't accept it. I cannot accept charity. Uh, but please tell Frederick to come by and see me uh, when, when he's in town. Uh, eventually, the, the wealthy African Americans would uh, give speeches and hold rallies. And they would take donations and they would send them to Mrs. Lincoln. And they would tell her that it's because of her husband that they were free. And so they wanted to give her a portion of their speaking fees, Frederick Douglass included. And Mrs. Lincoln accepted. Eventually, she was able to make enough money that she was able to pay off her debts. Eventually, she was given a meager uh for a president's wife, a meager um, stipend for him dying during the Civil War. And eventually, Robert put her in an institution because she was going to harm herself. Um, she'd been through so much. And so that was a humiliation. You know, here your son puts you away. Uh, on top of what the press is saying about you, on top of what people thought about you anyway, on top of your meager beginnings, that was stabbing the heart. But, but he was genuinely afraid she was going to hurt herself. Um, the way that the book ends is that uh, Elizabeth and Mrs. Lincoln continue to write each other and Mrs. Lincoln's always saying she wants to die. She doesn't want to live anymore. Um, and that uh, she, she wants to leave Elizabeth money for being her friend, taking care of her, always being with her. Um, she left some articles of Abraham Lincoln's to Frederick Douglass. She gave Elizabeth the cape that Mr. Lincoln was wearing um, to the theater when he was killed. And um, it's just it's just a wonderful firsthand story of what went on. And uh, what, there was a really cute part of this book. Uh, she talks about Mr. Lincoln. Well, you know, she worshipped him. And Mr. Lincoln loved animals, <laughs> loved animals. And he had two goats that he kept on the White House lawn. And those goats knew his voice and the minute he would say something they were trying to find him and they would follow him wherever he went and he thought that was just the cutest thing so he was standing upstairs and he said 
Mrs. Keckley, come here a minute. He would call her Madam Keckley. Madam Keckley, come here a minute. I have to show you something. These are the smartest goats known to man. Now, I'm just going to talk to you quietly, and I want you to watch how they act. And so he started talking to her, and those goats looked up, <laughs> trying to find his voice. And started frolicking and playing. And he, she said he just laughed and laughed and carried on. And she said, this man that would share those types of stories with me and share himself like that with me um, was her Moses. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And I encourage you guys, if you, if you can, to get this off of Amazon or uh, from your local library and it's just beautiful firsthand experience. And how ironic uh, that in the end, uh, the people that Abraham Lincoln saved um, ended up trying to save his family in the end. So I hope you guys enjoyed this story about Elizabeth Keckley. She's just a true American hero, a great friend. Um, and we all really should have an Elizabeth in our life.